So, uh, you're very welcome to the Executive Office Committee meeting. Uh, welcome online uh, through audio at this stage, Trevor Clark. Um, and we also then have apologies from Doug Beatty. Um, and the rest of us then are present in the room. We're just awaiting uh, George Robinson to join as well. Um, as ever, just that members can be careful with mobile devices just because the microphones can pick that up and we are broadcasting throughout the building and online. So item one is apologies. And at this stage, we have apologies from Doug Beatty. Um, and there's no other apologies after that. Uh, item two is the draft minutes. Just to inform you all that a revised copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of June are uh, included in the table packs. Uh, it's just it's revised because um, Trevor Clark uh, was trying to uh, join remotely and was in for a certain period of that meeting, um, but he wasn't recorded as attending. And I think he was having problems that day, as were we, mm -hmm. in having people connected. So we'll record um, him as being present for that meeting. Um, I can just welcome as well George there, if you can hear us, George. You can indeed. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay, so if you're content with that, then also uh, the minutes of the meeting from last week. Are members content and happy with those? Yep. Okay, so those are signed then and passed back. In terms of matters arising then, item three. Uh, following last week's Brexit briefing with the junior ministers, um, I have written to them welcoming their commitment to provide timely papers and responses to the committee, and I hope that we do see that sustained improvement to assist us with the work that we're trying to do. Um, the committee has also now been provided with a briefing paper on the Executive Office's June monitoring round position. Um, a copy of these can be found on page 11 of the pack. It was emailed out to members on the 26th of June. Uh, the paper also contains responses to the scrutiny points uh, contained in the raised briefing and the in-year monitoring round expenditure. Now, the Minister of Finance made his statement yesterday on the June monitoring round, and the department's allocation includes £2.5 million for the administrative costs in relation to the victims' payments, and officials are due to brief the committee next week on the victims' payment scheme, and we can get a breakdown of what the money is to be spent on then. So, are mem members happy? Although there was reference to it in a paper that we only got on Friday, but it was referenced to the June monitoring yesterday. We're getting the update next week from members, so we can query the the officials at that stage. Are members happy? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um. On. Item 3.2 on page 18 of the meeting pack is a response from the Executive Office to issues raised during the Brexit session with departmental officials at the meeting on the 26th of February. Um, and as promised by the junior ministers, a copy of the terms of reference of the Executive Committee considering EU matters was provided immediately. Um, a copy of that is available on page 22 of the meeting pack, and the Department has cited again another administrative error for the omission. Uh, of those papers to us, but we have all of that paperwork through at the minute. Are members happy and content to note items 3.2 and 3.3? Yeah. Okay. Um, then we will move on to the Executive Committee Functions Bill. Not the Functions of Government Bill. <laughs> it's how I'm going to know this one. Uh, and we should hopefully have first and Afternoon. Deputy First Minister. Good Hello. Afternoon. Afternoon. Afternoon, Michelle. As well. Thank you very much for coming along. Yeah, into the school chair seats as they are, <laughs> as they feel the single desks at the end of the room. But thank you very much indeed for coming along. It's appreciated. Uh, good to see you. And um, we're, we have two uh, separate items on the agenda today. The first is the Executive Committee Functions Bill. Um, the second then is the update on the uh, response to the COVID. Um, the first then maybe the Executive Committee Functions Bill. If we pass over to yourselves, uh, you can take us through just the different bits and pieces sure. of that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for accommodating us again today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about uh, this proposed Executive Committee Functions Bill. We hope that the Committee have had sight uh, of the information about the bill set out uh, in the letter uh, that we forwarded, uh, as well as the bill itself and the explanatory uh, memorandum. So briefly, the bill, or the need for it, has arisen through um, the interpretation placed on the Court uh, on the term cross-cutting, uh, as referenced in the Belfast Agreement and the Ministerial Code. Um, 
These documents refer to the responsibilities of ministers, but the court elided uh, the traditional interpretation as meaning statutory responsibilities with the idea of any issue in which any other minister uh, or ministers might be interested. So in the Buick case itself, for example, um, it meant that the dear minister who had an interest in the decision to grant planning permission to a waste incinerator uh, from his general responsibilities for the environment, including waste, the court then determined that that was cross-cutting and should have came um, to the executive and rather than the Minister for Infrastructure. So consequently, and to avoid the risk of future legal challenges on those grounds, uh, all planning decisions would have had to have been referred to the executive, meaning that the executive committee would have had to have taken planning decisions rather than the uh, Minister for Infrastructure. Um, so there are likely to be other cases, not just planning, uh, where one minister has an interest in another minister's decision. And actually, I believe you could argue that the finance minister has an interest in all decisions that are taken because, you know, in terms of the funding piece. Um, and so there was a need to um, deal with that uh, and uh, uh, try to take away the vulnerability to challenge on the grounds that it was cross-cutting and for the executive uh, to agree, uh, while the implications of the ruling are therefore clear for planning, uh, we, we wanted to deal with it right across government and not just in terms of the Department for Infrastructure. So that's why it's an executive office bill as opposed to a Minister for Infrastructure bringing the bill forward. Um, the reason for accelerated passage, um, Chair and Members, is because the Buick judgment um, is not just for consideration. It currently represents the law, and that means that the Minister for Infrastructure at the moment isn't able to take planning decisions. Uh, that there may be a challenge to, uh, and that, of course, has stopped a number of planning uh, decisions being made, and therefore there's a need to deal with this as quickly uh, as we can. Uh, and, of course, we are very aware um, in terms of COVID-19, uh, we need to get the economy moving, therefore we need to have infrastructure projects uh, with planning ready to go. Uh, and uh, we obviously and, and would not prevent people from seeking legal redress if, if they want to seek legal redress. But what we're trying to do is to get the process right uh, at our end. And um, we hope uh, that the committee will accept that this is an extraordinary uh, piece of work that was brought about by a court judgment when we were out of office and we're trying now to deal with it as quickly as possible uh, in office. So that is why uh, we're seeking accelerated passage uh, at this time. So I don't know if the First Minister wants to add I mean, that, that, that sets it all out, um, Chair. I think that um, obviously normally we'd want this to go through its normal procedure, but given the fact that we are faced with the time pressure, it's really, really important that we get this bill enacted before sort of the end of July to allow the planning minister to be able to take a number of decisions which she has now sitting on her desk and is, is unable to take forward. So not the ideal way to do it, but um, if we could get this introduced um, on the 7th of July and have our accelerated passage, then we are able to um, allow us to be able to correct something that Buick has obviously thrown up as a, as a challenge for us. But we've found a way forward. There's a lot of work put into this to find that way forward. But amending the 1998 Act is the is the way to do it. Thanks very much for that um, update on that. Um, the, I sh should have probably started off by before you had, uh, said that just to say that under Stanton Order 42.3 that, that there is a need for the department to give yes. us a reason for the accelerated passage and uh, the consequences of the, the, the passage not being granted and any steps taken to minimise that. So I think you've, you've covered that off in, in your presentation. C can I maybe just ask about the timeline of the bill? I know certainly from Business Committee I've seen certain elements of it for next Monday, but is that... Is there a further day that you would anticipate after that, or will it all go through next Monday? I think uh, the first and second stages are next Monday. Mm -hmm. um, from memory, I'm sorry I don't have the detail here, but we can certainly uh, you know, write to you about the, the whole issue of that. But I think it's first and second stage next Monday. You're looking at it completed by the end of July, yes. so that before yes. uh, we go off in, in August that it's there. And it's it allows done. then the infrastructure minister to take those decisions in August and then be ready to go. So we've written to the speaker, but I suppose it's his discretion as to yes. the timing of it. So I think that's how it will be handled. And although the committee will maybe form a, a, its own opinion in this, but would, from, from your experience, are you contend that it would have been a short enough bill that there's enough time 
that the scrutiny is there and that the although the full scrutiny won't be afforded to the committee, but there's enough there for it to progress in a short period of time. It is a very short bill. It's like um, clauses. Chair, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's just, just three clauses, actually. It's just um, the amendment of section 20 is the first clause. Uh, the commencement is the second clause, and the short title is the third clause. So it, it literally is a one-clause bill, really, when you look at the substantive nature yeah. of, of the piece of legislation. So a, a scrutiny stage with the committee would be ideal, but yes. where there's eight or ten clause, but this is very, very short and very precise. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Can Trevor? Here. Oh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just so that I got my head around this correctly, uh, the first time it went to court, the judge refused it because it was taken by the departmental official rather than the department itself or the minister. And the second time when it was appealed, it was because it didn't conform with Section 20, whatever, because there was more than one minister with an interest. Yes. So what this will do is bring it back to the Minister for Infrastructure to yes. make a decision. So we're well, right in thinking that it could still be appealed on normal planning grounds. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we would not seek to so diminish those yet, rights. Yeah, really? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. I've read this for an hour beforehand and I couldn't understand it, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pat. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for coming in. Um, are there still circumstances in which uh, a planning decision would be called in to the executive? Well, when I was, I've been an executive now for over 10 years, um, and there's really only been one planning decision that was called into the executive during that time, and that was the Belfast Metropolitan Plan, and it wasn't really um, a planning decision as such, it was more of a strategic uh, piece. We still have the right under this legislation to uh, pull decisions in if they are significant or controversial. If, we, if three or more ministers decide that it needs to be brought in. But really, we do believe that the planning minister is the person to make decisions in relation to planning. She has all of the information. Uh, she will have all, everything there, whereas the executive would not have all of that information. Um, but we still have the right to pull in uh, issues into the executive if we need to do so. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you both for, for coming in again this afternoon. We're dealing with planning a lot in the Infrastructure Committee, mm -hmm. and we've been dealing with industry across the board who are quite concerned at the length of time that it takes from a planning application to be through the pipeline and out the other end. So they don't want to see anything that's going to slow down that process. And I know for them, um, in terms of the ones we've been speaking to anyway, that they would welcome what you are bringing forward because they don't want, in fact, they're hoping that the executive looks at the planning process and provides <coughs> the minister with an opportunity to accelerate it even faster. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's important and obviously as we try to rebuild the economy then we need to be able to be flexible and actually lend ourselves to allow things to be able to come forward, planning projects to be able to come forward, having proper scrutiny of course but mm -hmm. um, coming forward and, and being developed and one of the things that, that we've done um, across all departments is that the finance minister has asked <coughs> all departments to list all the capital projects that they potentially have could bring forward, which would allow us then to try and push those things and get them done as quickly as possible to help build the economy and kickstart things. So I think that's a really important piece of work. Okay. Um, George, are you um, indicating there or to, to come in, George? No. Okay. That's Grant. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no further questions, then we'll we'll return to this after the, yes. the next part. We can have our, our the committee parts that we need for that stage. So we can pass on to yourselves then to give us just an update then on the COVID nineteen uh, response then. Okay, chair, thank you. Um, and a lot has happened in the six weeks since we were last here, and I'm glad to say progress uh, achieved in the intervening period have <coughs> exceeded our expectations. We're now um, on our way to a place where we can begin to really talk about recovery uh, and renewal. However, it is very important to acknowledge that the battle is far from over and uh, we cannot drop our guard for a moment when it comes to keeping people safe. We've seen flare-ups uh, in different parts of the UK and I think it is very important um, that we remember whilst we of course want to move to recovery and renewal um, that we remember that we're still battling with COVID-19. So since the middle of March the management of the response to COVID-19 pandemic has of course been our number one priority and our objective throughout has been to keep people safe and to support those who have faced real hardship as a result of the pandemic. Um, that remains the case 
now and it will continue to be the case, um, I believe, for the foreseeable future. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any quick solutions and we are caught up in a worldwide battle against the virus and the absolutely dreadful impact it has had on the lives of so many uh, in Northern Ireland. So we've just passed the midpoint uh, in a year and I think it is clear to us that the world emerges out of 2020 in a very different uh, place to the one uh, which we started in and uh, it's a, a daunting uh, reality that we have to face as we try and chart um, the way ahead. But we have learned a great deal and uh, I think we have come a long way in a short period uh, and therefore we've much to be hopeful and, and optimistic about as we continue to deal with COVID-19. I think we can be very proud of how, as a society, we've responded to the crisis uh, in the way that people have pulled together right across uh, the community and the respect and care they've demonstrated um, in the support they've shown for our magnificent uh, NHS workers and all of our carers right across Northern Ireland, all of whom who have been in the front line in the fight against the virus in our hospitals and, of course, in social care settings as well. And the resilience of our communities and the willingness of local people uh, to do their bit in helping to overcome um, all of the challenges, I think, is, is, really, is really inspiring and is a testament to all that is good uh, in our society. We've heard a lot about negativity, um, but I think there's a lot to be positive about uh, in terms of what has happened in Northern Ireland over this past 15 weeks. Uh, we've gained a lot from our experiences uh, as well um, and an insight into the things that matter most um, to people and we've learned about um, what people really value um, in society and um, I do also think it's important, Chair, to recognise and acknowledge the constructive way in which um, the Assembly has played its part right throughout this crisis, continuing even in the most extraordinary of circumstances. Not every legislature have been able to do that. Uh, we have been able to do that. And I think the establishment <coughs> of the ad hoc committee on the COVID-19 response has really enabled the executive to maintain its focus on the emergency response, but at the same time, uh, be able to be held accountable on the floor of uh, the assembly and in the committee in particular. So that has really worked well. Um, obviously, the regulations governing the restrictions uh, on businesses and individuals have been uh, changed now, I think it's eight times, um, and our junior ministers have been coming to the Assembly to, to deal with all of that, and I want to thank them for the way in which they've been able to do that. Uh, we didn't design to do things this way, but uh, I think it is important um, to recognise that we have been working well together and um, trying to be responsive uh, to the restrictions and in infringements on people's movements uh, and to make sure that we don't keep them for any longer than is absolutely necessary because when we introduced these coronavirus regulations, the test was were they necessary and were they proportionate to the threat posed by COVID-19 and we have always kept that to the front of our mind when we're looking at relaxing uh, the regulations. So committee members will uh, be now be quite familiar with our five-step plan for moving out of lockdown. Um, we've been able to accelerate parts of that and we're pleased about that. I think some people felt that we should have had a timeline initially with our plan, but as far as we were concerned, we wanted to be as flexible as we could be, depending on the transmission of the virus, and I think that that has worked well. Um, we have now given indicative timeline uh, on uh, a lot of areas, and I think, again, that has been broadly welcome. There's obviously some areas that are still needing to be dealt with, and we'll continue to deal with those in the executive um, in the weeks to come. So... Chair, I'll finish there and I'll let the Deputy First Minister um, come in now, but obviously we're very happy to take any particular questions you have on the regulations or the guidance. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. And I suppose it really doesn't feel like it was six weeks since we were here last <coughs> time. It certainly flies um, when you're in the middle of trying to, to deal with all of the situation that we're faced with. Um, I suppose just um, firstly, to, to, to start in particular today, our thoughts are with the family of Noah Donoghue. Obviously a tragic, tragic situation and I'm sure um, everybody would agree in terms of our thoughts and prayers are with the family at this t this dreadful time. Um, as I've said here and said the last time and we've said it consistently throughout um, this period that our number one priority has been the delivery of comprehensive response to protect people 
to support those who are facing hardship as a result of the lockdown measures that have been needed. This has involved a huge effort from all everybody involved, and there have been very many of our health service and social care workers, teachers, essential retail staff, those providing local government services, industry, employee representatives, church leaders, people in every sector, public and private, community and voluntary, who had to abruptly stop their normal work and their normal working practices to join in the fight against COVID-19. And they have helped to manage the risks and mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. The progress that has been achieved is entirely due to the support and the concerted efforts of everyone, and as a result, is now reaching a key turning point in the management of the crisis, where the executive's attention is able to move from purely controlling the public health response towards planning for economic health and societal recovery instead. The announcement last Thursday of further significant easements and the indicative dates for a rolling timetable of changes to the restrictions mean that there is now clarity <coughs> for every sector. So it allows everyone to make preparations for how they can safely uh, restart and reopen. Over the next two weeks, people can look forward to being able to enjoy uh, normal things, going out to a restaurant, visit tourist attractions, participate in collective worship, get a haircut or go to the gym, whatever um, it is that you're, you're wanting to do. However, COVID-19 is still in circulation and as, and as the restrictions are eased and our behaviours or all of our behaviour and choices will determine the outcomes in terms of future transmission of the virus. None of us want to see a second wave of the pandemic, so the executive will be keeping these changes under review, mindful of the need to respond quickly in the event of there being any significant outbreak or increase in transmission. That's the nature of the problem that's facing us, and it's important that we all uh, recognise that recovery and the application of public health guidance go hand in hand, and it's vital that all sectors, businesses and individuals take the necessary actions that are required to protect us and limit the spread of coronavirus. We certainly have come a long way in a short time, and it's great that we're now um, able to carefully reverse our way out of the restrictions. I'm hopeful that in the weeks ahead, as I said, further positive changes can be possible. However, easing restrictions is only the first stage of recovery, and recovery is only one small <coughs> short-term aspect of well-being. COVID-19 has knocked us all off course on our journey towards improved well-being for all. It's been a very heavy knock, but we must look to getting back to where we were on our journey. We need to build on the strong cross-sectoral working partnerships that have been forged in the heat of the crisis, and also to continue the dialogue with stakeholders as a basis for strengthening and enhancing societal well-being. Our initial priorities must be to get our economy working again, strengthen our health and social care services, and mitigate the immediate societal impacts caused by the lockdown. However, these are not the only challenges facing us, and in moving forward, we also need to be prepared to pick up on urgent priorities and plans and other important uh, and unconnected uh, matters uh, unconnected to COVID-19. <coughs> the need to address long-standing economic and societal problems, the promotion and protection of rights and identity, end in sectarianism, housing supply, hospital waiting lists, the need to transform the delivery of our health services. The list goes on, and that's without even mentioning the NDNA commitments that were made. So, work is now underway to develop an executive work programme to progress all of the priorities while continuing to monitor and respond to the situation regarding the pandemic, and we hope to be able to say more about that in the near future. I think, Chair, that's probably an appropriate note in which to finish, and obviously we'll now take uh, members' questions and views. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, Minister, so people across this island have been asked to make immense sacrifices during periods of grief and loss in order to protect others. Um, and I recognise that the loss of a friend and a colleague is difficult. Um, we certainly experienced that within our group in the Assembly. Um, but as political leaders, we have a moral duty to uphold the spirit and the letter of the COVID regulations. And we have to share in the sacrifice that we are asking others to make. <clears throat> and all political leaders should be reflecting if they can say that they have made the same sacrifice. Now, Deputy First Minister, on the 4th of June, you said that we have to send a, a message very clearly that by gathering in such big crowds, we're actually spreading the virus and actually that's killing people. On the 18th of May, you commented that these people are reckless and quite possibly spreading the COVID-19 virus in Belfast. I think it was wrong and they should look to themselves and really ask themselves the question, are they putting people's lives at risk? So can I ask you, after yesterday and reflecting on yesterday, do you feel that you can reflect and say that maybe people's lives were put at risk? 
Well, firstly, let me say that this is a very, this has been such a trying time for everybody and anybody that's lost anybody throughout the pandemic, your heart goes out to them because we've all been in the situations, we've known family and friends who've lost and they haven't been able to grieve in their normal uh, grieving processes, they haven't been able to have their mass, they haven't been able to have their funeral. And at the height of the crisis, as we worked our way through this, I mean, that was the most difficult thing for many people. You talked about your own colleague. I could, I could reference lots of people that actually lost. And for every one of those people, I think they're going to have such a difficult time just with your normal grieving process to actually work your way um, through things. I think that, you know, where we are today is a, is a good place. You know, we're making steady progress. We've been able to lift a lot of restrictions. That's all very good. We continue to do that and we'll continue to uh, move, move forward on that journey. But I think, you know, w w when I reflect on, on, obviously yesterday, I led to rest my friend. Um, and like he was someone who was obviously a giant in political uh, terms here. He's someone who was so well respected that I had no doubt whenever Bobby died that there was going to be thousands upon thousands of people that would want to come along to his uh, funeral. And there are things that are within your control and there are things that are outside your control. So in terms of what's within your control, let me say this. I brought in the regulations, so I believe in the regulations. I believe in the public health message. I will continue to articulate the public health message. I will continue to do all of those things. So in terms of what was within uh, the gift of uh, the organisers of the funeral yesterday, um, obviously church services, chapel masses are now uh, reinstated. And we've done a lot of really, really good work with the church leaders around that partnership approach and how we can actually manage this and how you can have proper social distancing in place. So in terms of the Requiem Mass, which I was invited to by the family and was um, my pleasure to attend, uh, that was all done in accordance with public health guidance, all done and worked out very carefully and meticulously with the Catholic Church in terms of the, church, the, the Mass itself. And that Mass was, very, was socially distanced, it was, uh, people wore masks. It was all done in accordance with the public health guidance. Alongside that, you also have a funeral cortege, which I was also invited to participate in, of up to 30 people as per the regulations. And that's exactly uh, what happened. 30 people walked behind the funeral, um, behind the coffin in the, in the funeral cortege. And then alongside that, then you had a, a ceremony at the, at, the, at the cemetery. And again, 30 people uh, as per the cortege um, participated in that. What was done very, very carefully in conjunction, and I can say this, uh, the, the organisers worked with the PSNA around, the, the, reg, around the, the regulations and the restrictions that we put in place, particularly around the issue of stewards, making sure that the whole route was um, stewarded. I'm sure, many, many, I'm sure many committee members actually can, can talk about many funerals that have happened and people have had to try and find a way to um, demonstrate their grief, and they've done so by outlining the route of funerals. So... Um, hundreds of people um, came along to line the route of the, of the funeral to provide that marshalling uh, marshal role to prevent an overspill of people coming into the funeral cortege of 30. Um, and that, that was all done, in, as I said, in conjunction with the, the PSNA. Can I just say this? I mean, a lot has been said about this, and you know, we shouldn't be playing on people's emotions. I mean, anybody losing anybody uh, is it, just, it's just such, such, a sad, such a sad time. I'm satisfied that my actions are within the regulations and the public health guidance. My actions, um, I stand over. And I think that it's really, really important that we continue to, to deliver the public health message, that we need to work our way through this, and we are working our way through this. Um, but I think that, uh, for me, certainly, uh, yesterday was a very uh, emotional time, as it has been for many people who've lost uh, someone throughout this um, crisis. You, you participated in what took part yesterday and a consequence of that was that, as we saw from the uh, media, was that there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were squeezed beside each other lining the route. I mean, do you feel that you need to apologise to those people to be able to say that potentially those that in amongst that crowd, if one person in there had coronavirus, that they would have been passing that to dozens of other people who will go home and potentially pass it to dozens more people? I mean, for those that for the last three months have stuck by the rules and haven't organised cortèges and haven't organised other of the events around funerals because they know that it might bring crowds. And again, I talk from experience because we know how much we would have loved to have had a cortège for John Dallet, a, a true Irish patriot. We would love to have been able to have church services and line the routes, but we knew that wasn't possible. We would love to have travelled, but we knew that that wasn't allowed. 
Um, but do you feel that being part of what was there yesterday, that because there could be that consequence that you need to apologise to those people that were brought out by what was happening? No, I think that, well, firstly, let me say that um, for anybody who's lost, for any, anybody who's lost anybody, that is such a tragedy in normal circumstances, but dealing with it in COVID crisis times has, has exasperated everybody's grief. And, and we're very conscious of all of that. And we're also very conscious at times throughout the pandemic, particularly whenever you refer to your own colleague, whenever John died, you couldn't have a requiem mass, but you can today. You couldn't have a funeral cortege, but you can today. So we are, we are in a different uh, space today than where we were at any given point in this pandemic over the course of the last um, four months. I, uh, in terms of what is within your gift and within, within your control, as I have um, stated, uh, the stewards that were there were two metres apart. Every one of the stewards were two metres apart. Um, so that's important just to, to put that on, on, on record. And also I would say, that, say this, given the huge figure that Bobby Story was, and the important uh, person that he was for, for all the Republicans out there that, that very much loved him. Um, I think that there was no doubt in my mind and in the family's mind that whenever he passed, thousands upon thousands of people were going to descend on, wanted to come and play their part in terms of the funeral. So actually, whenever you look at what was done, the organisers were able to provide an online streaming of the funeral. That again was just to encourage people to watch it online. Can I tell you 250,000 people watched it online? That shows you the scale of what the funeral could have been um, yesterday. So I, I think that all the things that were done were done in, as per, in terms of what's within your gift, as per the regulations and the public health advice, particularly when it came to the Requiem Mass, particularly when it comes to the funeral cortege, that's all in line with, it, with, with the guidance. And I do think the mitigation that was put in place around providing the funeral service online and things like that were all, were all crucially important parts to try and manage uh, what was going to be an even bigger crowd than, than was actually there. I, I think, Deputy First Minister, the issue was leadership, and I think the, the, the strongest leadership would have been to have publicly told people not to attend, to let the family have their grief, and to let them uh, deal with the grief and the issue in the way that they could. But in participating in that, participating in selfie photographs, um, Pierce Doherty said this morning that if it was on Sunday, he wouldn't have travelled. You were down in Dublin on Saturday. It just seems to be that there's one set of rules for some people and different set of rules for other people. And that's very difficult for people to digest. And there can be a number of people out there that will question the moral authority that can come if you set rules and then you're seen to be breaking those rules. And I'll finish by just simply saying, have you considered, can you discharge the role of joint head of government with any authority after this? I absolutely can, and I can stand over my actions, and I can very publicly say to anyone watching on, this is a very difficult situation. We absolutely understand that. I have led through this pandemic from the front. I will continue to lead from the front, from the front, and I will continue to work within the regulations. And I encourage everybody to stick within the regulations and the guidance as we have set out. That's so so important. We're not out of the woods yet. We're still working our way through this. We are in a very good place, particularly when you compare to where we could have been today. So I, I think it's, um, it's very positive where we are today and we have to continue to do our best in partnership, working together. I'm also very satisfied that I can stand over all of my actions as per the public health guidance and advice. And I think it's unfortunate, I do think it's unfortunate that a lot of the charges that are being levelled to, uh, towards me are political point scoring as opposed to actually being about the rules. But that's not the takeaway, let me be very clear, to anyone who's lost throughout this pandemic this has been an absolute nightmare. We have been through it with uh, many, many people. I have sat with many families. It has been the most trying of times for everybody. But thankfully, we're in a space where we're actually moving out of the crisis part, part of the pandemic and we're moving into recovery. And I'm so glad for that. And I want us to continue on that journey. But I can assure you, it's not political point score whenever mm -hmm. you've been through the situation and you stick to the rules and you do it right. That's not political point scoring. That's observations. But I can I'm also... going to pass now to Chris. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, Deputy First Minister, could I read to you a message that I received this afternoon from a constituent of mine in the Beaver Estate? Um, she says, to think I respected what she said every day when laying down the rules to save lives, and we all try so hard to adhere to them, this is a kick in the teeth. I feel like, why have I given up so much? Not being able to kiss or hug my mother to wave at her through a bloody window while she was in Marie Curie and slipping away 
all this sacrifice to obey the rules, then to have a send-off, which offended people by not having them there because of the rules, when my heart was already in pieces. I'm just so upset, to be honest. Was it really so important for you to be at Bobby Story's funeral? Well, yes, it was important for me to be at Bobby Story's funeral. But my constituent in Beaver can only bring 10 people to her mother's. And I'm glad now the restrictions now say that she can bring that people can bring 30 people, and I hope to get us to a point where we actually are allowed to, more freedom for people to be able to bury their dead in a dignified way. Like, it's been so hard because that, that, that lady is a case in point. People have had to choose which family members they took uh, to their funeral. That has been a harrowing experience. Imagine um, having, to, having to do that yourself. Um, and, and I experienced that even yesterday at the funeral where some of the, the, the Bobby's family weren't able to walk in the cortege because they were, they were sticking to the, the number. We were where we were throughout the last four months, and those restrictions, we always said they were draconian. We always said that we wouldn't keep them in place for any longer than necessary. So my message to that lady would be to, to say very clearly that I'm sorry that she lost her mother, that, I am, you know, that we have tried to lead her way or work her way through this pandemic as best as we can. People have been excellent. We are where we are today because of the behaviour of people, and I'm so grateful for that, and I hope long may it continue. But I will continue to work our way through this crisis and to lift restrictions, to allow people to get back to having their requiem masses, to having their proper funerals by not having to choose which family members they would have to take with them. I want to make it clear that this is not political point scoring, and it's not about the nature of the, persons who, the person who was being buried. Well, I do find it incongruous that family members weren't to walk behind Mr Storey's funeral, but it was absolutely vital for you to do so. Why is that? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a political leader. I am mm -hmm. the Vice President of Sinn Féin. Mm -hmm. Bobby Storey is a huge Republican political figure and icon, mm -hmm. and I was there at the invite of the family and was only too glad to take it up. You are indeed a political leader, and <coughs> I put it to you that your credibility on the public health messaging is now shot to bits, because from week after week, you, along with the First Minister, appeared at a press conference and urged people to follow these rules. I was in hospital for a week, and my wife and children weren't able to come and see me in hospital because of these rules. I know other people who have buried children, and only 10 people were allowed to attend that because of these rules. And people look on and see that event, and I put it to you that your credibility is shot. Well, that's your, that's your viewpoint. It's not mine. Could I ask you if the First Minister, and I'm not for one second suggesting that she would, but if the First Minister had turned up at a paramilitary funeral yesterday, what would your response be to that? Yesterday was Bobby Story's funeral. It was not a paramilitary funeral. It wasn't for, a paramilitary. For, for, for a start, it was a lovely tribute to a Republican leader, to an icon who meant so much to so many people. Uh, Republicans would have came in even larger numbers from right across this island and actually further afield to be at the funeral yesterday had they been able to. But we actively discourage people. We actively, um, for example, the things that are within your gift, the things that are within your control. For example, stewarding. Hundreds of stewards stopped thousands of people being able to descend on a cortege. Also, the online screening of the funeral was really, really important because that again allowed people to watch from the comfort of their homes. So those were uh, important um, steps that were put in place to try to manage what was going to be Obviously, from, from, the, from the very start of this, we knew it was going to be um, a huge uh, challenge to be, able to, to be able to work our way through, not, or not people coming along to the funeral whenever um, they could obviously watch, watch from home. Were churches not issued guidance that funerals, marriages and baptisms were not to take place in churches? My understanding of the guidance that was issued to churches was that they were open for prayer, but that ceremonies such as that were not to take place. So we've done a lot of really, really excellent work, I have to say, with the churches, and we have established the Church Leaders Forum. And throughout the pandemic, both from just supporting people spiritually, um, we, I, I'm very grateful for the work that we've been able to do with churches. But we were very clear last week in the latest meeting, with, which the junior ministers actually took with the church leaders and the faith leaders, um, the chief medical officer, the chief scientific officer, went along to that meeting and they discussed out how churches could reopen. And obviously they reopened from Monday past. <coughs> um, and the one thing that the church leaders asked for, given the different sizes of churches, um, the ability to socially distance, um, ventilation, all the other um, factors that are taken into account, 
They asked that we're not prescriptive about numbers and, uh, and who could come along to the services, and that message was delivered very clearly to the churches. So there were, there were, there's been masses, there's been church services from Monday, uh, whenever the restriction was lifted, and and I'm glad to see that in place. And it was exactly the same uh, leeway was given for chap for mass, for funeral mass, for um, for requiem mass, and for weddings. Or sorry, not for weddings. For requiem masses, for those people, uh, the churches to be able to open up as long as they could socially distance, and that's what happened yesterday. But, sorry, I asked a question in terms of the existing guidance being issued to churches. Is it that can funerals, marriages, or christenings take place in churches at the present time? So. The exact text that was sent out to clarify this, some, some church leaders yesterday said that please be assured the places of worship may determine the number of people who may attend for a uh, funeral service. This is the same principle as to how many people may safely attend inside for a church service. Sent yesterday? This was clarified to, uh, in response to uh, a query. Yesterday. Was the word draft across the top of it, I think? Was, is that right? The are, you, document? are you now privy to executive papers? No, I've just read it on the BBC website. The current uh, general guidance in relation to funerals <laughs> that I can see, um, correct me if this isn't the most up-to-date position, but it came from the um, NI executive website. Funerals should be private, and only the following should be there, up to a maximum of 30 people. This figure does not include funeral directors or other people needed to officiate at the service, such as faith, pastoral representatives, grave diggers, and so on, including members of the person's household, close family members, or if the deceased has neither household nor family members in attendance, then it's possible for a number of friends to be there. You're not a member of the person's household. You're not a close family member, and you've just told me that there were other family members available to go, so why were you there? I don't think it's for you to question what funeral I would choose. I'm to reading your guidance. No, with all due respect, I don't think it's for you to decide or determine or to be any sort of arbiter as to what funeral I may or may not attend. Members I'm, of the I'm fairly confident, I can just say to you, I'm fairly confident and I stand over that I, my actions are within the, the regulations and the public health guidance. So I can only control what's within my gift and I can say very clearly, I stand over uh, and, can, and can very clearly say that I was within the guidance and the regulations. Well, I have to tell you, Deputy First Minister, in conclusion, I do not believe that the body of public opinion is with you on this one. Pat. OK, thank you, Chair. <coughs> and, uh, first of all, can I say, since this pandemic started, I have had three friends who have died. Bobby was the third. Uh, and, in fact, the last time both of you were in, I mentioned the fact that a friend had been uh, buried that day. Uh, in fact, uh, Arlene mentioned the fact when I, I mentioned that he had played for a distillery. Mm -hmm. She mentioned her father was a supporter of distillery. And if he was still alive today, he would have remembered Jerry Higgins because mm -hmm. he was one of the top strikers for distillery at that time. And I suppose what I'm going to say is in those, in those three situations, the guidelines were different each time because we had moved further into the process of, of relaxation. <coughs> but I think what's important to say is that in all this controversy, there's a family that's grieving, uh, the Story family uh, and the Pickering family, who I know very, very well. Uh, in fact, I've known Bobby, Bobby Story for 45 years. And even prior to knowing Bobby, we shared something in common. We also shared that with Bobby Sands, and that all of us, as young teenagers were driven from our family homes uh, as a result of the institutionalised sectarianism in this state. We all lived in unionist areas and we're all driven out. Um, and Bobby uh, was a remarkable man. Uh, I was with him in the army, I was with him in prison and I was with him in Sinn Féin. And when he set his mind to something he never did it half-heartedly. He put his whole heart and soul into it. And I understand uh, unionists uh, wouldn't have any truck with his actions while he was a member of the Irish Republican Army. But what's being missed in all of this is the role that he played in developing and reinforcing the peace process. 
And I mean, some commentators have said in the media that uh, he was some sort of enforcer within the IRA and forced people to accept the peace process. I was in jail with Bobby's story in the early 90s as the peace process was developing. And he was fully supportive of that process. And he was released in May 1994, just before the first ceasefire. And he immediately came out and threw himself heart and soul <coughs> into helping the leadership develop and solidify that peace process. And he didn't enforce the peace process uh, among volunteers within the IRA. He encouraged them, he cajoled them, he argued with them, uh, and he eventually won those arguments with them about the benefits of the peace process and taking the gun out of Irish politics. And only for people like Bobby Story, we wouldn't have the peace process that we have today. Would we have needed uh, one, but for people uh, like uh, Bobby Story? Mr. Amber. I beg your pardon? I said, would we have needed one, Amber, but for people like Bobby Story? Amber, through the chair, please, well, and <clears throat> please, un un uninterrupted. Well, it, 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 it wasn't Bobby Story who drove himself from his own family home as a young teenager. It wasn't me who drove us from our home or Bobby Sands from his home. We were all, and none of us sitting in this room, are responsible for the political conditions that exist in this country today or for the last 50 or 100 years. We're not responsible. We were born into them. We were dealt the cards that we got, and everybody played the cards that they got. And, I mean, the, the reason I mentioned uh, myself, Bobby Story and Bobby Sands in the same breath is that none of us were born into hardcore Republican families, but we were all affected by the circumstances that we were born into, and we reacted to the environment that existed around us. And, I mean, I have no doubt in 100 years' time, people will still be talking about the role that Bobby Story had uh, during the, the, the political developments of the last uh, 50 years. And I, and I think it's important to put that on record, uh, given all the controversy that has taken place around the funeral, that it shouldn't be forgotten the role that he played in bringing about that peace process here today. For my good chair. Okay, um, Martina. Um, uh, as I listened to um, what you had outlined around the COVID um, process of change and how eight times the regulations um, have been changed and we've all lived through the different changes. And just like Christopher, in terms of that text, we've all dealt with families throughout the process who were complying with whatever the regulations that you put in place um, at that time. And we are thankfully going forward um, into, into a different place. And I think, you know, as you listen to some of the comments that have been made today, it is very, very important that whatever people's views of the, the involvement uh, of republicanism within a struggle and a war that came to us, we didn't start the war, we didn't start the conflict. And um, we need to be mindful that Theresa Bobby's partner, pa Bobby's sister and two brothers and the extended family, their hearts are broke. And so is ours. We're all very, very heartbroken with the sudden death of Bobby's story. And Michelle, you had to be there yesterday. The Republican family needed you there yesterday because you give us comfort and guidance to the family of Bobby Story and to the wider Republican family. And I know that today you have been the subject of a lot of comments. And I want to say that I want to thank you on behalf of all of us, because we couldn't have got through yesterday without the support that you have given us over this week. And I'm hoping, as people reflect on last week, we've seen a guard 
being buried in the south of Ireland and because of the, the way restrictions have been there, Leo Farrakhar and others, I believe, you know, and the Garda Commissioner and others in attendance, I didn't observe any process being put in place as was there yesterday for those of us that had the privilege to be in the Guard of Honour and the Black and Whites constantly. There was about 30 metres apart from the cortege before any of us started to proceed behind you. And constantly you heard the advice being given to ensure that social distancing was causing people stopping and making sure that people didn't get uh, too close. So I just want to make the point in relation to um, how the Republican family are feeling at this moment in time and how heartbroken we are, just as you were heartbroken at that time. And we are now in a place where thankfully you are easing off on some of the restrictions. But I just repeat, we could not have got through yesterday without your support. And I think that Bobby Story's family needed you walking with them every step of the journey. Mr Chairman, I, I really think that I should speak now after a period of time around this issue. And I've listened very carefully to what the Sinn Féin representatives have to say about uh, the Republican narrative around all of this. And of course, they're entitled to have that narrative. I too was forced from my home at the age of eight by the IRA. My entire family forced from our ancestral home near the border, all because my father was a police officer and a Protestant. So we could all sit here and reminisce about things that have happened in the past. We're supposed to be talking about the COVID-19 regulations and how uh, they have impacted on the people of Northern Ireland and how we need to make sure that we give clear messages out as an executive in relation to making sure that they are followed. I think the credibility of that message has been severely damaged as a result of what happened yesterday. There are many, many ways in which people can pay their respects. I had to pay my respects to Edwin Putz, whose father, Charlie Putz, was a founding member of the Democratic Unionist Party. I should have been at that funeral in ordinary circumstances. But because I'm the leader, I decided to do otherwise. I should have been at Jim Donaldson's funeral in Kilkeel, father of Geoffrey Donaldson, a veteran who served this country with distinction, but I chose not to go to that funeral because it was the wrong thing to do. And therefore, I do have to say that our message has been damaged as a result of what happened yesterday. But I hope that people will look at it and say two wrongs don't make a right. And there's a need to continue to keep looking after ourselves, making sure that we comply with the regulations and making sure that we comply with the guidance from a public health point of view. Northern Ireland has been very fortunate in the fact that our population has been very good in taking those messages. And I thank the people of Northern Ireland for doing that. I think we have protected our NHS staff in a most fabulous way. And I pay tribute to the work that they continue to do day and daily. We do not want to see a spike in coronavirus in Northern Ireland, uh, which we have seen in other parts of the United Kingdom. And we need to be ready in case that does happen. But I do think it is wrong that we spend our time today at the committee reminiscing about what happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s. We have to deal with the public health of the people of Northern Ireland today. And that's the message that we have to get out, that it's still very important that we comply with the guidance and we comply with the regulations. <coughs> and that's what I wanted to say to the committee today. OK, well, and I thank First Minister for that, but there is a palpable sense among a great number of people out there that those that are providing that message aren't sticking to that message. And that's some of the point that some of us are making here today. And I'm going to pass now to Trevor uh, Lunn. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I do wonder what would happen if there was another major Republican death next week and there had to be another funeral, because this is not the first uh, Republican funeral. I acknowledge that they're normally massive. In normal times, Michelle, you rightly said, there would have been a lot more people there than what there was yesterday. But it was very hard to look at the pictures of yesterday on stream or on TV or whatever, on the news, and conclude that 
that it all complied with the, the uh, COVID-19 regulations. It, it just frankly didn't. Now, if, if there was a senior loyalist paramilitary figure who needed a funeral in the next couple of weeks, I think we, we could well be having the same conversation because it, it's not restricted to republicanism. You want to honour your uh, what you would call your glorious dead. Others might have a different description of somebody like Bobby's story, who I met once or twice. The, what, what gets me, and Christopher touched on it very eloquently, there, there's so many other funerals where people have had to bury their dead, not, not even be by the graveside to, to bury their dead. Restricted to 10 people, no church, no graveside, nothing. <coughs> had to see the coffins go into the crematorium, just carried in, nobody else allowed in. And I, people have put up with that, they've respected the regulations, they've honoured them as best they can. I didn't see much evidence of that yesterday, to be honest. Now, even today, there's a funeral in Belfast, and we all know who I'm talking about. They, if the family there have respected the regulations, I understand it, they have asked for a private funeral. I mean, half of Belfast would be at that funeral if it was open to the public, but they're not. And I, I suggest that they won't turn up in numbers because they'll respect the wishes of the family. So I just, I just wonder, you don't need to answer this if you don't want to, but do you, do you respect the feelings of people who have had to undergo that sort of trauma when they watch major Republican funerals? Which, which flout the rules. Uh, you may differ with me, but that, that's my opinion. Can you understand the, the hurt and the anguish that they feel and the, the outrage that they weren't able to provide the same goodbye to their loved ones? That's the question. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, of course I can say that anybody who's lost anyone, I've said it here a few times now, anybody that's lost anybody in the midst of coronavirus have had to deal with um, their loss in such a you know, such a, a way that just denied them that opportunity for to get a hug or to, you know, just to their normal circle of support. So I absolutely understand people's anguish. Of course I do. Um, I have sat with many families throughout the course of the pandemic, particularly when we were at the peak of the pandemic, um, around talking through, you know, the restrictions and what it means for funerals. And, and at different points in time, you weren't able to have a requiem mass and you weren't able to have 10 or 30 or any number of people behind your, your funeral cortege. But you can now, and we need to actually keep building on that. Actually, as a matter of fact, we, you know, we've always said from the start, don't keep these draconian measures in place for any longer than is necessary. That remains the position. As soon as we're able to lift things, we need to be able to lift them. So for anybody that has lost and had to, to, to bury their loved one in the, the height of the crisis and uh, the middle of the pandemic with no so support whatsoever, you can, never, you can never change that. Nothing's going to change that. That's something that's happened to them. And all we can do is try to support them. Um, but what we had yesterday, again, was another grieving family who deserve no, uh, you know, dif no, no difference of approach. They had the same challenges as, as many other um, family members ha have went through. So I, I, I'm very sensitive to that. I'm very sensitive to the fact that their loved ones getting so much attention um, today. I'm very sensitive to all those that have lost. Um, but my message from here today is, is crystal clear. I believe my actions, from what I could control, what I was in, in terms of what was within my gift, I adhered to the public health advice and the guidance. Um, the, the measures that were put in place, the organisers of the funeral tried to limit the crowds, the huge, huge crowds that were expected to attend by providing the online streaming, by working with the PSNA around the, the, the stewards that lined the route to try to prevent um, people coming into the funeral cortege, because that would have um, brought it above 30. And also... Um, making sure that people were socially distanced and, and that message was repeated um, all day. So, uh, look, I, I understand this is such an important <coughs> thing. And I, I'm not in, like, it's not about, we shouldn't be trying to play, I'm not, not saying you're doing this, one funeral against another. It's not about that. Um, this is about respect um, for everybody who's dealing with a very challenging cir circumstance. And my message today is that uh, we need to continue with the public health advice. We need to continue with the, the regulations. And also, <coughs> we've made great progress and we'll continue to make progress. And I think we should uh, bring more clarity around the issue of, of, of funerals if that's what's required because that's the space that we clearly are in. We were able to lift restrictions in terms of requiem masses and we were able to lift restrictions in terms of the numbers for funerals. But at different points in this crisis, 
that wasn't the case. That certainly wasn't the case because of the restrictions. Yes, um, sorry, Jerry, you mentioned what was within your gift. Now, as, as a major political leader, I would have thought on the occasion of a funeral of a major member of your party, an ex-IRA man, a, a Republican <coughs> icon, like you called him earlier on, that it was within your gift to ask people not to turn out in huge numbers. But the message, whether it went out implicitly or otherwise, was come and give Bobby a big send-off. You, they were, you were all delighted to see that number of people on the streets, close together. I'll accept that there was 30-ish following the coffin. I think maybe slightly more than that, but let's not be picky. That and uh, that, that, I would say that perhaps that funeral was organised slightly better than some of the previous ones, OK? So you, you learn as you go along. But no, nobody, I don't know what the family's views were, what, what their wishes were. I do, I do wonder if, if the family had said we'd like to have a private funeral with nobody there, would that, would that have been respected? Or is it just a Republican thing that you must turn out in these huge numbers, even during a pandemic, to remember somebody who you, you valued? Well, Trevor, can I just say this? Um, everything was done absolutely in accordance with the family's wishes. They were burying their loved one. So to me, he might, he's my friend, but he's also a Republican icon, as I have said. But to his family, he just was Bobby. He was a granda, he was an uncle, he was a partner. So everything was absolutely done in conjunction with the family and what they wished to see and what their wishes were. And can I say this, I have not been involved in organising any other previous funerals. So any other funerals that have happened have nothing, you know, it's not been anything that I have been um, associated with. And also, thirdly, I suppose, or finally, I didn't encourage anybody, we didn't encourage people to come along. What we asked for was very clearly, if you look at what I promoted, I promoted the online um, streaming of, of, of the funeral to allow people that opportunity to, to, to do that. Um, and I believe that had we and the organisers not put together the plan that they worked up with the PSNI, if they had not put that plan together to try to limit the number of people, it would have been even bigger crowds of people coming um, along. Um, so I think all the things, the mitigation that was put in place around the stewards was, was crucially important and I, and I believe that really helped the situation and I do believe the online piece was also um, excellent. Like 250,000 people watched it live online. That shows you the, the number of people that potentially could have come, come along. Um, and I just think that, you know, we just need to be sensitive to, to, to all of this. But, you know, I'm confident that everything that was within my gift that I was able to adhere to all the public health regulations and guidance. Well, I don't normally cross swords with you, Michelle. We get on pretty well personally. I would say the same about Pat and others in your movement, but um, I'm not convinced by this at all, to be honest. I think there was no effort made to control the numbers. I think it was seen as a big Republican event, but in, in, in normal times, pe people would, would <coughs> put up with these days, but frankly we do. Uh, these are not normal times, and there should have been a much greater effort made to try and control the thing. And if, if people in two weeks' time start coming down, if there's a spike of COVID-19 cases in West Belfast. Who, who are we to blame? Where does it come from? It, it's almost inevitable. And that, going back to the regulations, that's what the regulations are for, to try and stop that sort of thing from happening. And to maintain isolation, social distance. There was, there was no social distance yesterday. And I know that uh, St Agnes is a, church, it was, it was a big church, but I also think there's over 100 people there, maybe 120 people in the church which wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed at the moment, otherwise, you know. So, I, you know, we, we can beat this to death, frankly, both of you, but I don't think we'll, we'll have a meeting of minds. Well, and, that's, and that's fair enough, Trevor. That's, we do, you're right, we do have a good um, working relationship. And, but, but, I, but I would say this, what happened in the chapel was absolutely within the public health guidance. There's no, there's no issue there. Everything was done, three to the pew, a, not, or a space in between each pew. Everything was done in accordance with the guidance. People wear masks. People can do that. Let me say that to everybody at home. This is allowed. This is what's allowed if, you, if you've lost someone in, this, in the period that we're in now, from Monday past, when the guidance changed around um, services opening up again and masks being able to open up again. This is allowed. So anybody at home who's, who, I hope, you know, anybody who finds themselves in a situation losing someone this week, you're allowed now to have your funeral mass. That was brought in um, on Monday past. So in case there's any... Um, All right, fair enough. But, uh, but you have to public, you have to do the, the distancing and follow the public health, you know, good hand hygiene yeah. and all those other things. 
and the churches are going to work their way through that themselves, yeah, depending on their own setting. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Okay. Thanks. Emma. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to you both um, for coming in this afternoon. And I thank everyone, obviously, we, we've spoken at, at, at length about this, um, and I suppose you touched on it there, Michelle, and, and that the regulations and what was within your gift you were doing. I suppose throughout this pandemic, we've seen, I think, one of the first um, instances of the, the laying of the road. There was a, a very haunting video at the very start of this in County Kerry, where people lined the, the road for, for miles, and I suppose that was what was happening yesterday. And Big Bob was was a, a legend, um, and, and, and people wanted to pay their respects, but I suppose from our party's perspective, we were following the regulations. Um, just in... Um, Relation then to the the ongoing easements and our sort of pathway to recovery. Could you give us an outline of the indicative relaxations now at this point and where we're going from here? Okay, so um, we I published our plan last week. So we, we initially didn't didn't um, go down the route of putting dates to things, but we but we decided that we are in terms of our own recovery plan that we had got to the point where community transmission is as low as it's going to get in the absence of a, of a vaccine. So that's the advice from the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Officer, um, that it's as low as it's going to, as it's going to, to get. And I think that's um, really important in terms of us being able to then move to be able to lift the restrictions. So we set out our pathway last week, which um, in includes the, um, the, the, the number of dates for things to open up. So obviously, uh, in terms of the tourism sector, um, all those things that are opening up from this Friday, um, in terms of uh, a whole range of things, and actually there's a really, really good graphic which we point people to, and um, which is now on the executive's uh, website on social media, which people should follow in terms of um, the things that are the, the opening dates for the various different sectors. So we, I think that's a really positive piece of work, and it actually is, demonstrates just where we're at in terms of the fight back on, on COVID. Um, and I think that uh, we, we continue to have this discussion again on Thursday at the executive around what else is still outstanding, what else that needs to be brought forward. I welcome the fact that this week the, the issue of visiting, for example, people in nursing homes or in hospital settings, that's a really, really positive um, step forward as well. So you can see there's a, there's a, um, it's a steady as you go um, rolling programme of easements, which we've been able to announce, and I'm really delight, delighted that we're, that we're at this point, um, and our, our attention is very much focused now on recovery. Well, just to be clear, uh, Chairman, in terms of uh, church services, we did um, allow churches to reopen again in conjunction with some very good working at the church's working group. Um, and I was absolutely delighted that all faiths were represented there, Muslim, Sikh, Jewish, um, the traditional uh, Christian uh, organisations. It was a really very good coming together and something I hope we can build on for the future, actually, in terms of engagement with the faith communities right across Northern Ireland. Um, so that was uh, on Monday. Uh, tomorrow we hope to have a further discussion in relation to gatherings um, indoors and outdoors because I think it is important that we continue to try and give clarity to people who are planning events and we know that there are many people uh, who would ordinarily plan their weddings for the summer and that they are concerned uh, about whether they can go ahead or whether they need to reschedule so uh, we need to be able to do that as well. And. Uh, the draft guidance in relation to special services such as funerals and weddings and baptisms and christenings uh, will hopefully be looked at tomorrow and we can sign that off. Just just one more then question. So obviously childcare and I know that um, caring in general is a, is a field that's predominantly the, the role of women and, and there's been a lot of conversation about how childcare is going to impact upon recovery and, and as we move out of the restrictions. Can you give some detail on the work that you've done with the, the sector and people employed in that industry? This is a, a vital part of the recovery and renewal piece uh, around childcare because obviously people, families um, with children cannot be expected to return to work uh, and to return to productivity if they don't have access to uh, childcare. So we've been working with the various um, parts of the childcare sector, whether that's um, childcare settings, um, registered childcare, informal childcare, um, to try and make sure that we work with them in an appropriate way to make sure they have all the guidance they need and indeed all the financial support that they need as well. And 
Uh, you will be aware, Emma, that we did um, put in place a childcare support um, grant. I think it was £12 million was put into that pot of money. We have been concerned uh, that that money hasn't been getting out to the childcare sector as quickly as it should have been getting out. We still think there's an issue around that. Um, BSO and the Department of Health uh, are dealing with those applications. We think there needs to be uh, a look at that to try and get that money out in a faster fashion. I was contacted by a number of childcare settings in my own constituency to say that they were really at breaking point and needed access to the money. Um, so I hope that that will be sorted out very soon. But we're very aware, and indeed the Deputy First Minister and I um, brought together the Department of Health and the Department of Education to really get a grasp of this issue because we know how fundamental and strategic it is to the renewal and, and growth of the economy here. Yeah, huge issue. And if we're going to be successful in trying to build our way out of this and try to rebuild the economy, a crucial part of that has to be childcare. Childcare was a huge challenge before COVID-19, but I think the COVID crisis has certainly shed a, more of a light on it. Um, so I think that the, the, the grant funding scheme that was put in place, that the money hasn't went out the door as quickly as what it should have. So um, health and, <coughs> and education are, are looking at that. But I do think that um, we we have to, in terms of the conversation that which we're going to be having around how we rebuild and recover, um, the, the crucial element of that has to be the childcare piece. You can't be having everybody back in work and then no childcare available. And also, I'd be worried that women will be disproportionately um, affected as a, res as a result of, of the childcare challenges. So I, I think that that is a crucial part of what we need to focus a lot of effort on in the time ahead. Thanks. Thanks. We have two members that are on uh, by Starleaf at the minute. Um, <coughs> George, have, I think you've been indicating and looking to come in. <clears throat> Just at the outset, uh, I do appreciate that all families have to grieve for a loved one. And I'm, I'm not making a political statement. I want to make that very, very clear at the very outset. But the scenes that we all witnessed yesterday at the Republican funeral, which was attended by the Deputy First Minister and other Sinn Féin ministers and others, was to put it mildly, was insulting and disgraceful behaviour and a slap on the teeth to all those families and others who have adhered to all the strict funeral guidelines that have been set by the executive, which the Deputy First Minister is part of. And I would ask you to apologise to those grieving families who have lost loved ones due to this horrific virus. And if not, you should consider your position with your resignation. Sorry I have to say that, but <clears throat> I think it was disgraceful what, what happened yesterday. And maybe one other question to the Minister. And we, we talk quite often about a second wave. And could that crowd possibly trigger a second wave of this pandemic in this part of the city? I'd like to pose that question to the Minister as well. OK. Um, thanks, um, George, for, for all of that. I think that, I mean, I think we've well rehearsed this issue now, um, Chair, but just again to to say to anybody that's lost a loved one in this crisis, when the restrictions were what they were, um, our hearts really go out to them because it was such a trying and difficult um, time. And I think that we're going to have to find ways to support those people um, going forward because you know people are going to have an opportunity, need to have an opportunity to uh, to deal with their grief and actually find a way to, to mourn and and to and to, to heal. So. Um, that's certainly something that um, I'm very conscious of and something that I want to be able to support people with. Um, in terms of a second wave, I mean, we've always said that there potentially could be a second wave. I think a lot of attention is turning now to issues such as clusters um, because that's been um, highlighted elsewhere. And I think that um, what's, what's crucially important uh, in our fight back is actually the tracing work that's being done. So the, the, the body, the, the groups that's been set up in order to contact trace any cases and make sure that that um, work is done. That allows us to identify very quickly, and this is something the Chief Scientific Officer has said to us, that allows them to very quickly be able to identify any cases, any clusters, and allows you to be able to react um, accordingly. So that is a crucial part in our in our fight back. Um, we, obviously, we hope we don't get a second wave. Um, absolutely hope we don't get a second wave. Um, and we need to continue to uh, work our way through this as to give people the easements that they desire and need um, at the same time just trying to, to manage and try to mitigate against the potential of a second wave or, or clusters which we may probably see um, coming forward. 
So I think a part of the issue with contact tracing, this is a very important point, and when I was at morning prayer on Monday, I had to fill out a form. I had to say what my address was, where I was sitting in the church, uh, what area I was sitting in in the church, and then I left that behind me uh, in a basket when I left. And I, I was greatly encouraged by that because that means that if there, and there, there quite possibly can be outbreaks um, in church settings. And uh, I was greatly encouraged by the fact that the um, Church of Ireland I was attending was taking the guidance very seriously. They were completing those forms in a way which meant they knew exactly who was at the service. They knew that if something happened, they could trace those people in the particular area of the church that the other person was sitting. And that is exactly the sort of thing that we need to see happening um, right across uh, Northern Ireland. We know it's a real challenge for many churches uh, to do this, but I think it is very, very important if we're to try and control um, any outbreaks, any clusters that might happen, uh, we will know exactly who was there at that particular point in time. And I do hope that that's been, that good practice is going to be rolled out right across congregations as they come back uh, to worship Almighty God. Okay, I'm going to go to Trevor. Just f f Trevor, I know you were looking in for a question. Are you there still? Yeah, yeah go on ahead, Trevor. I was going to listen to eulogy from Pat Sheehan to a man who may have died and be buried yesterday. He was a convicted terrorist. I can listen to that eulogy and, and for you to allow that to continue was deeply disappointing. But, Chairman, uh, I think the Deputy First Minister has missed many points because social media is full of pictures from the funeral yesterday. And it's clear from those pictures that you can identify approximately 40 with the funeral court age. And for that reason, she's in breach of the rules. And I haven't heard a reasonable explanation other than some sort of patriot to a terrorist organisation as a justification. So maybe if the First Minister, or sorry, the Deputy First Minister hasn't seen the pictures, we can, maybe this committee should furnish her with those pictures of that court case with the number of people that were present. Also on social media since yesterday, and maybe I'm asking the Deputy First Minister directly, what about selfies at funerals? Are they acceptable? I couldn't hear a lot of um, what, what was said there. I think that the issue has um, been well rehearsed in terms of the approach yesterday to the, the funeral and the fact that I stand over that I'm satisfied that my actions are within the, the public health um, guidance and, and the regulations. I think that, you know, Trevor, you know, I was always rare never to speak ill of the dead. Um, so I would say to you that you should refrain from trying to go down to, to personally attack someone who was just led to rest Yesterday, you can have your own political perspective on things. You can have your own political outlook, um, and that's all right. Uh, but I, I have a different outlook. Uh, and I am the joint head of government. I have demonstrated leadership the whole way through this crisis. I will continue to demonstrate um, that leadership. I'm also uh, a Sinn Féin representative. I'm also vice president of Sinn Féin. <coughs> and I am proud to have uh, led my comrade to rest yesterday and to be part of that funeral service insofar as reading um, a poem that was something that was very poignant to, to both Bobby and his partner, um, Teresa. I think that uh, in terms of the, the issue of selfie, the, yes, absolutely. Uh, that was something that just happened in the blink of an eye whenever I was leaving the, the, the graveside where people nearly bounce up beside you and there's a photograph taken. I, I, uh, you know, that shouldn't have happened. I'm, I'm absolutely OK to, to, to say that. Um, but everything else, uh, as I said, was done um, as per what was in our control was done within the, the public health guidance. Well, then, can you remind me what the guidance is in relation to uh, people congregating inside in terms of social distancing? I, I think you were saying about inside churches, but we've already that's already been discussed and explained, Trevor. Maybe. No, I, I, said inside, Trevor I said inside the building. I didn't say which building. Well, I, I would What's assume the it's the same within most buildings, but is there guidelines for g gathering inside a building? We every every sentence different. You we should. haven't signed off on that yet. It'll be tomorrow probably when we sign off on that. Okay. okay. Well, well, Deputy First Minister, there's another picture then. I, I presume that you know because that was the same people in the white shirts along with your party colleague Sean Lynch. No social distancing and much more than 10 people present in the picture. What's your views on that in relation to people's concerns 
uh, after all you have done in relation to the COVID-19? I, I was very clear in, in telling people that they must adhere to the public health guidance and they must adhere to social distance, and I made that repeatedly uh, in the run-up to, to the funeral and at the funeral, and will continue to make that, make that case. Well, uh, specifically, if your party colleague Sean Lynch, who was with the guys with the white shirts, I, I, and, uh, indoors, and they were all close for the picture. Yeah, I have, I have no, I haven't saw the photograph that you refer to, but my message to everybody is, is crystal clear. We need to adhere to the public health guidance and we need to socially distance and keep two metres apart uh, where, where you can possibly do that. And, and there lies the problem. See, your message has been clear up until yesterday. And, and to be fair, people broadly have followed the guidance between what you have given out and the First Minister, and I think that was welcomed by everyone, that everyone adhere to those rules. But I have to say, I've been inundated with people saying, that's it, COVID-19 is over. The Deputy First Minister was asking over thousands of people yesterday, so this is all a big joke. And that's how, and I fear that people are going to react in such a way because of your attendance at that mass funeral yesterday. Uh, Martina, you're going to come in just quickly on childcare as an yeah, issue. Um, just, I would just like to go back to that, to that issue um, because I'm aware that you're very conscious of the fact that the £12 million uh, package that was released it did not result in a number of the centres, and you mentioned uh, earning some in your own constituency. And the Rainbow Child and Family Centre in Derry, for instance, was one of the many that's been in touch uh, with ourselves. And I have sent a question in to the, department, to the Department of Education, but I'm conscious now it's the Department of Health as well, so the crossover of that. But one of the things that had been suggested by the actual centres themselves, the child care providers, was that, that the criteria for drawing down that funding would be looking at, rather than having to devise a whole new scheme, that the scheme is there and perhaps the criteria for that scheme could be widened and building on just what Emma has said um, in relation to her question, that that might be something that could be looked at, rather than the providers having to go through a whole process of waiting till a new scheme. There's 12 million already set aside, and if there would be any way the executive could look at the criteria to see if it could be loosened a bit or widened a bit in order for the providers to draw down the funding that's been allocated. Happy to take that on, on board and, and raise it with the um, health and education. I think the, the issue with childcare is problematic for a number of reasons not least because it falls between two different departments. I don't think that's ideal in terms of an approach uh, to childcare. Certainly, it's not something we've discussed, but certainly maybe in the future, there's a, an argument to be, be built around, you know, bringing childcare in under one department. Um, yeah, so help, yeah. yeah, so the regulation is the Department of Health, and then the policy sits in the Department of Education, which makes it um, difficult. Um, and I think the organisation that was to deal with the grant applications is the BSO, which sits wholly within the Department of Health. So there's, there's a, there are difficulties <coughs> there, and I've been made aware of those difficulties just this week as well. And I went to the Department of Education, yeah. and obviously then it's the Department of Health that's uh, providing the funding, so okay. that's something worth looking at. Um, look, maybe on a final point, um, a point that we raised yesterday with the uh, junior ministers, um, just our junior minister, about the confusion that there is with announcements. The announcements come out and you just make them upstairs and there still remains a lot of confusion with people out in the different sectors. That if they do hear their name or they don't hear their name yeah. or if they, their, their particular trade is, isn't referred to and you know, we all end up with, with huge amounts of questions and queries. And one of the recommendations that we had suggested yesterday to bring back to yourselves was that use of the ad hoc committee. That if you are making an announcement on a Thursday and then a Monday, that the following Thursday, if somebody was able to come to the House and then members could ask their questions and queries and get some of the clarifications that would help people because we're then flooding, I'm sure, the private offices with email after email and letter and text messages and everything through the ministers to try and get that clarity and that it might just provide a one hour, one hour and a half tight space in the assembly just to ask the questions to get the clarity and if something can't be clear it can be sought and sent on to people afterwards. C could you take that away and, and give that consideration that if, I know sometimes the announcements aren't relevant to one minister but 
you know, maybe for a couple of weeks there just needs to be a couple of ministers hanging about on a Thursday afternoon to be able to give the updates <coughs> that people need because that clarity is critically important because it's people's lives, it's their livelihoods, it's the food that goes onto their table, literally for these people, and they're, they're desperate for information. Um, a messenger message or a Twitter message or a direct message in other forms at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and you're going, we don't know, we'll write off tomorrow and it could be two weeks before you get a response back. It's sort of, it's not great. So would that be something that you could give some consideration to? Well, I think absolutely, uh, Chair. I mean, you shouldn't be waiting two weeks, by the way, for, for clarification. Uh, that should be yeah. pretty straightforward, I would have thought. I mean... We, at the start of the relaxation, obviously it was the big ticket issues that we were dealing with, and now we've got down to more granular issues, and I do accept that um, it is difficult sometimes to cover all of those things, and I think the driving instructors probably um, was a good example of that, where uh, we believed that we had to come to the conclusion that they fell into the same category as other close personal contact services, such as hairdressing and things like that. Um, so there was a bit of confusion around that. We've dealt with that now, but uh, I do accept that as we get down into more granular issues that um, there are issues around that. So let us take that away and we'll certainly come back to you about that issue. Okay. Um, we had written to you and suggested there might be one or two questions on Brexit, but I I'm, I'm appreciate that for you've been here you for an hour and a half. So, um, <laughs> Martina, you have a Brexit question? Yeah, um, uh, forgive me, I know you have been here a long time and I know you have a very busy schedule. We had a meeting in the Infrastructure Committee this morning where there was representatives from a number of ports um, in attendance, the Foyle Port in Derry, Warren Point, Lauren and Belfast. Um, I want to just, uh, just share with you some of their exasperation about where we're at at the minute because they feel uninformed, um, unprepared a lack of clarity. They have been dealing with uh, DERA throughout this process. And from what I understand, at, um, Brendan Lewis, the Secretary of State, he, he addressed a solace meeting on the 22nd of June, and where plans at the, about the local ports were uh, to be brought forward. Um, DARA had told them, or DERA, sorry, had told them that the deadline for bringing that plans forward would be the 29th of June, which was yesterday. But on the 22nd of June, the British Secretary of State told those in attendance that the plans for the porch uh, being submitted, that the business case was uh, the proposals of the plans were too excessive. Well, of course, like 40% of the trade in the foil port alone is going to be damaged as a consequence of a potential you know, no deal, no future relationship. So these ports are asking that they, the relationship they have with the HMRC is next to none. Uh, they are engaging with, uh, with the Department of Agriculture, who had actually a plan, which was for yesterday. The transition is over, as, as we sit here today, as the deadline of that is over, so they can't ask for an extension of that deadline. So they are asking if, the, um, if Brendan Lewis, um, in terms of the decision that he has made and the announcement they made in that, at, at that meeting, um, how that uh, impacts, for instance, on the ports, the four ports, but particularly, I have to say, I was more concerned about the foil port and the port of, uh, in Belfast and the port in Warren Point. Uh, the, port, the port in Lawrence feeling that because it's a ferry operator that that might come back into being whatever what happens in the future relationship, but the others um, are going to be severely damaged. But the HMRC relationship, I think it's appalling. Uh, it's shocking, it's alarming, and also their lack of engagement and lack of clarity from the British government as to where they stand going forward. I suppose it's a matter for the Secretary of State himself to answer in the first instance, I suppose, but um, what I would say is that DERA um, has to get on with all the necessary work and they can't be deflected or detracted from getting a credible and, and a workable plan in place without delay. And I mean, that's something that's been agreed with the the British government and, and with the EU, so like the, the plan has to be in place, the work has to be done. Um, we're hurtling towards the end of the year very, very quickly and um, this work needs to be in place. So as you know, uh, Martina, we do have a Brexit subcommittee at the Executive. Uh, as I understand it, DERA have written to DEFRA uh, in relation to the points of entry issue um, as of uh, yesterday, I think. Um, so that will be on the agenda for us tomorrow uh, to have a discussion in relation to all of that. Of course, our job is to make sure 
uh, that we minimise any uh, checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that there's unfettered access for our companies into Great Britain. Uh, and so we'll continue those uh, conversations with our own government. Um, uh, Deputy First Minister and I uh, attended the Joint Committee. I um, can't just remember the date of it now. Uh, I think it was the 12th of June. Uh, we will attend the Joint Committee again when it next meets, I think, in September time. Um, and we will, of course, be trying to make sure that uh, Northern Ireland's position is protected in what is a very complicated set of negotiations. Can I ask just another wee, a small Absolute question? Absolute final it, point, well, please, it's, it's, it, it's in relation to the legislative programme. We have only mm. one committee uh, before we come back in September. And I know the legislative programme has been impacted. We all know by, by COVID. But we're going to face a potential crash at the end, at the end of this year. So, and that's going to be a big challenge. So have we any views on how we're going to handle that? Well, I mean, we have been, um, and uh, I'm sure neither of us would make any apology for this, absolutely um, looking at COVID over this past uh, number of weeks, uh, Martina, but we do recognise that we are now going to have to try and balance, as well as the Brexit issues, the legislative programme as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we will be coming back to that. As you, you know, we're working through July this year. Ordinarily, recess would be coming up very fast. But I think it is right that we continue to work through July to try and deal with some of the issues that we haven't been able to deal with. The um, committee had asked that I write to you last week requesting an oral statement to the House on uh, next Tuesday to give us an update on Brexit and give an opportunity for um, some uh, conversations, given that we've moved essentially beyond the ability to ask for an extension to the transition. And obviously then businesses and key industries out in the uh, community are um, very thirsty for information and guidance and, and a heads up on what's going to happen in the months ahead. Is that something that you have given consideration to yet? Well, I think, Chair, I mean, obviously, uh, we do, of course, want to be as open and transparent with the committee in particular and the Assembly, of course, generally as well. Uh, the specialised committees are meeting in July. It may be of more benefit uh, if we come after uh, those specialised committees take place so that we have more of an idea as to where we're going. Uh, Dara has just written to DEFRA as well, so we would need to find out what the response is in relation to that. I don't know whether next Tuesday is uh, the best time to do all of that, but again, we will want to be as open and transparent with you as we possibly can be. Well, it's, it's welcome that you're accepting the concept of, of oh, yes. at some point very, yeah. very soon coming to give us an update in, in the House so that all wider membership of, sure. of the Assembly can have those conversations. Um, Okay, well, look, first and Deputy First Minister, thank you for coming along. The, thank you for the continued work that you do in terms of COVID. Um, you remain to have key messages, there's safety advice, and there is essential guidance that needs to be given to the community and leadership that needs to be given. To be honest, the best place to give that is from the high ground. And if you lose that, you lose the ability to give that message amplified and out there. And I hope that that high ground can be reclaimed and that we can get the message that we can work with our communities and we can provide the key safety that we need for people out there in the face of this pandemic. But thank you very much for coming along today thank and we you, appreciate Chair. your presence here thank and you. look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we are going to move them back to the Executive Committee Functions Bill, not the functioning of government bill, because I keep having to... see before you lose maybe what's been said from the Joint First Ministers with regards to the process they're going to be involved in, it might be necessary for us to consider that we may need a committee outside of scheduled uh, in July if the Specialist Committee meetings uh, are taking place, and we might need to assume and call. Well, we, we 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 already stated whenever we were doing our forward work program at, that we if yeah. we need to come back, yeah. and we were aware. Don't worry to the staff that that yeah. may be something that we just come and gather come and that gather. there may not be a big staffing element for that because um, staff Oosh. have their leave. But we certainly we can gather as a group of members uh, yep. to, to discuss yep. any of that that's yep. there. So. Um, the Executive Committee Functions Bill, the accelerated passage. Um, so, members, the introduction of the uh, bill, the First and Deputy First Minister will move a motion in the Assembly asking that it proceed under accelerated passage procedure. Are you content to support 
the minister's motion that the bill proceeds under accelerated passage? Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. Then the second stage of the bill is scheduled for the 7th of July. The second stage debate focuses on the general principles of the bill. Uh, are there any comments on the general principles of the bill that have been... I think it's fairly gauging that it's fairly straightforward. It's not, yeah, not a yeah, complex yeah. bill. Uh, are you happy to support the general principles then at second stage? Yeah. Okay. Um, right, that's all we need for that. Yeah. And okay. If you give me just 30 seconds of that many bits of paper in front of me, that and notes from Martina. Okay. Item number six is the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, committee consideration uh, response. On page 47 of the meeting pack is a draft response to the Committee of Finance on this committee's consideration of the, of the bill. Um, do you want to give us, um, Clark, I know you've done prepared a report, do you want to give us a quick run through and what's in that? The draft response is there, as the Chair has said, in page 47. So at last week's meeting, the Committee agreed not to come to a view on the relevant clauses of the Bill and just to provide the Committee for Finance with a summary of the Committee's consideration of the general principles before second stage um, and details of the written and oral evidence that we receive. So paragraphs four to ten set out the committee's consideration um, prior to second stage. Paragraphs eleven to sixteen outline the committee's consideration of the relevant clauses and then paragraph seventeen is the conclusion um, in terms of uh, simply forwarding the details onto the committee and not reaching an agreed view. That's fine. Okay, are members content with the draft response as presented? Yep. Okay, if you are content, then the response will be forwarded to the Committee for Finance to inform its clause by clause scrutiny of the bill. Okay, we'll move on then to item 7, which is an SL1, the Salaries Public Services Ombudsman Order Northern Ireland 2020. On page 61 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Members, the Assembly Commission proposes to make a statutory rule under paragraph 6 of Schedule 1 of the Public Services Ombudsman Act, Northern Ireland 2016. The statutory rule will amend the salary payable to the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman from £97,337 to £100,257 per annum. It will also link the movement in the salary of the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman to the movement and salary of staff employed by the Assembly Commission. It is proposed that the statutory rule, which is subject to the negative resolution procedure, will come into operation on the 27th of July. Are members content with the Assembly Commission's proposal to make the statutory rule, or whether they require any further information, either in writing or by way of an oral briefing? It's fine. Okay. Uh, members, item 8 is the Forward Work Programme. Um, it is on page 66 of the meeting pack. Yeah, content to note what's in there? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sure, our, our, our meeting next week, is that a one item agenda? It's yes, there'll probably be a few things to tidy up, but one briefing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, item nine then is correspondence. There are six items of correspondence in the meeting pack. Item 9.3 at page 90 of the meeting pack is a correspondence from the Clerk of the Justice Committee advising that the Committee for Justice is content with the proposal to transfer the statutory function to make changes to the procedural regulations that govern the practice of the Special Educational Needs and Disability Tribunal from the Department of Education to the Department of Justice. Um, this will be done by way of a transfer of functions order which will be brought forward by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and will be considered by this committee in due course. Members happy? Yes. Yeah, yeah correspondence. Uh, item 9.4 on page 91 of the meeting pack is a copy of correspondence from the Chairperson of the Committee for Justice to the First and Deputy First Minister requesting further information regarding the Attorney General and the interim arrangements put in place and the proposals and timescale for the appointment of a permanent successor. Um, can I suggest that the committee request to be copied into the response uh, to the Committee of Justice? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item 9.5 on page 94 of the meeting pack is a copy of correspondence from the Northwest Migrants Forum to the Executive Office requesting urgent support to put in place a wide range of actions to address racism. 
Um, this uh, can I suggest the committee that we request to be copied into the response uh, to the Northwest Migrants Forum. Chair, yep. see on that. Mm -hmm. Can we? Because conscious that obviously the I mean the racial equality strategy is is topical now with, with everything that's been going on. But there's a number of strategies that fall under the remit of TEO with an NDNA and obviously at the time of the agreement, what there was a hundred days before a timeline would be published and that has now lapsed and obviously attentions have been elsewhere. But would it be something you mean could we could we write to the department asking for an update on these strategies? Is potentially something we could put a motion through the through the house on and maybe see if we could get committee support on that. Definitely. And we did write a number of, uh, probably about two months ago, three mm -hmm. months ago now, to get that full breakdown of all of the NDNA um, <laughs> strands and, and what where the strategies and where they were at and what the time scale. So we could ask maybe for the relevant uh, strategies to this committee or to the executive office and see where they are. Yeah. Okay. And that might build into part of, could be part yeah. of your homework under section 10, which we're coming to in the chairman's <laughs> remarks in a bit. Um, so item 9.6 at 98 of the meeting packets, correspondence from the Development Trust CNI requesting to brief the committee on its work in community wealth building. Um, there is a list of stakeholders requesting to brief the committee and we will be considering those at the strategic planning meeting on September the 9th. Our members are happy to note that request at the minute with the others and we'll give it consideration at our strategic planning meeting and then see where we can... Uh, I'd appreciate a briefing from them. Yeah, so we can get that scheduled in then with, with the others which would be good. Um, are you content to note the rest of the correspondence? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are having our strategic planning meeting um, on, on the 9th of September. We have emailed all members yesterday asking for initial thoughts on what the committee's, committee's strategic priorities could be for the rest of the mandate. Now, we did circulate um, that request much earlier in the year and the chair and deputy chair at the time were the only two people that responded. So. There's a carrot and a stick, which I always think is the best approach. Uh, it'll take about five minutes to complete that form and submit it back in. Um, if that doesn't happen, then we're going to have to, at a meeting, at some point in the future, go around and take five minutes with each member and ask them. So that's going to make that meeting last about an hour, to an hour and 20 minutes longer. So can I suggest that people, just in an email to the clerk, say, I think the following are the areas that we should look at. If people do that, then... Uh, the clerk can actually collate those and then at our strategic planning meeting we will actually be able to say well five people have asked for this and three have asked for that and then we can start to put the... the I didn't see that particular form. How is it structured? Um, it's a wee table. Yeah. Yeah, I actually thought table, I'd put one in myself. No. Well, I, I, might I suggest that the form should look like um, a ballot paper? <laughs> And you put one beside the issue that you... Yeah. Is, does it look like that? Well, yesterday when I reissued the request, I actually didn't include the template. I simply asked for the headings and a priority order. Right, OK. So yeah. I know if you've given me three, I know which one's your number one, number two, number three. Right, OK. Is that what you mean? No, what I meant was if if you were to put on the form... I haven't seen Just it. these in orders of preference. <laughs> yes, if you were to put on the form everything that's a policy area covered by the department and people were then to put you know one beside what they consider to be their number so if HIA was mm -hmm. one of the options that someone puts one beside and, and say five of us put a one beside that is we want that to be our one of our priorities going forward and then eventually if everyone does that you you will eventually emerge with a list of do you get me? You're, you've yeah. not been to many election counts, have you? <laughs> <laughs> this is just turned into an STV election very quickly. Do you see the difference in what I've done? Well, yeah. you see, I haven't seen yeah. yours, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. See, that's well, that. Yeah, that's uh, I, I think maybe what you're saying is, I know what you're saying, Christopher is probably suggesting, tell us what all the areas are and then we'll prioritise yes. them. But what you're saying in the email, if people just have their top three and put yeah. them in and set them in, yeah. when we put all nine people's top three together, yeah. we'll probably end up with about a dozen, but we'll be able to see where the connections are. Fair can enough. we try that method first? And if that doesn't work, we can revert to yours. PRSTV, yes. yes. <laughs> no problem. Okay, if members are, are, are happy uh, to note that. Um, then if there's any other business? No. No, well then, members, we can draw ourselves to a close. We're meeting Wednesday the 8th of July, this day week, at 2 o'clock in this room. And thank you very much for your attendance today. Thank, thank you. you.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.